Um, I'd like to welcome Jayendra and Fritz um, to the stage. So just give them a warm round of applause, please. So talking first will be uh, Jayendra. He's uh, the Chief Architect and Head of Research um, at NSS Labs. He brings a wealth of experience in malware, phishing and exploit analysis. He and his team maintain a comprehensive database of threats prevalent in the wild and have, and have built automated live testing infrastructure that runs in a minimal, with minimal supervision. Um, along with NSS Lab researcher Mohamed Saha, he has built an, ex an exploit hunting tool, BaitNet, um, which gathers real-time intelligence on exploits, or which, which gathers real-time um, intelligence on exploits. And um, Fritz, he's a senior machine learning engineer at NSS Labs. Um, he has been in the security industry for more than five years and published numerous papers and formal, on formal concept analysis, machine learning, pattern matching, and, and knowledge discovery in databases. He's, he is an inventor of various US PTO registered patents and is also um, in, in advanced analytics. Cool. So, Without further ado, let's get started. So thank you so much for having us here. I mean, this is the first time we have come to Australia. And thank you so much for the hospitality and um, giving us the opportunity to present a paper on our uh, threat hunting. So so, <clears throat> so, like I said earlier, I am Jay Jandra. I run uh, offensive security research at NSS Labs. And my colleague, uh, Fritz Venter, he's a data science expert, and he runs a data science team at NSS Labs. So to, in today's uh, threat environment, there are a lot of organizations that are constantly bombarded by a lot of different actors, right? Malware actors with the, with the, with the purpose of uh, spreading mass malware, and there will be some APTs kind of attacker that tries to get in the system. So threat hunting has become a more of a new, newest kind of field so that you can adjust your security posture based upon what the attackers are thinking. So it's essentially, at the end of the day, trying to f uh, find a needle at the haystack, right? So attackers have different motives and uh, different ways of getting in the system and trying to get the, the modus of identity of the attacker using threat hunting is really, really challenging, right? So most of the, <clears throat> most of the things that we have done in the past, uh, there are a lot of threat hunting still that are available in the market and it comes with the inherent flaws. There is, it's extremely difficult to, to properly do threat hunting using uh, commercial tools. And on, and on top of that, if you want to build some open source solutions, it's, it's quite tricky to scale this thing out. So I have uh, uh, divided the presentation in two parts. Uh, the first set of the presentation, I'll be talking through some of the inherent problems, the uh, threat hunting tool uh, as it exists in the market today, and what are those things. I'll be going with those, um, uh, the, the, with the pain points for the threat hunting tool that are currently available, either commercially or through open source tool. So that's the first part of the presentation that I will have. And the second part of the presentation will be how do we address those kind of gaps on the tools that exist in the market today and how do we better create those things in-house so that, so that it can be scaled um, to fit the organization needs. So that will be something that will be, <clears throat> that, that will go into the architecture and what are the best practices to actually build those kind of tool in-house. So that will be presented by, uh, by Fritz. So anyway, so hunting. So if you look at the <clears throat> Oxford Dictionary, Hunting means you are searching determinedly for someone or something, right? So in today's context of threat hunting, threat hunting is more about proactive and iterative approach to detecting threats. So it falls under the active defense category because it is performed mainly by the human analysts. There are uh, tools that exist uh, to do the log aggregation. There are tools that can be utilized to better parse the structured data. But at the end of the day, it always requ requires a human analyst to go through the data that has been collected and come up with some predictable solutions, right? So, so that's, uh, that's, that's threat hunting. So what are the prerequisites, prerequisites for the threat hunting, right? So the most important prerequisites for, uh, for threat hunting are three, knowing the enemy. So if you're hunting something on the wild, right, you have to understand the motivation of the, of the enemy. Is the motivation of the enemy purely de determined by uh, the financial gains, like mass malware campaigns or, or, or the guys that are spreading exploits uh, around the world using um, malware advertisement, or you are looking for somebody like um, 
APT kind of attacker who are predetermined, who, who, already, who always have a uh, selected predetermined modus operandi so that they can be going after a selected target using any kind of tools that are available on the market. So that is the most important thing uh, that uh, threat hunting, any threat hunters should be looking at. And the second thing that, uh, that also involves is knowing the tools, right? Knowing the tools meaning that I need, to, I need to aggregate a lot of different logs coming from my endpoint agents, from my network appliances, firewalls, web application firewalls, this and that, right? So at the end of the day, all these logs that are created, it has to be aggregated at, the, at, at a central depot so that you can effectively use those uh, uh, logs to determine if <clears throat> something is good or bad, right? There are a lot of uh, commercially, commercially available tools out there. There are a lot of sims out there, but at the same time, uh, those sims or the tools that are commercially available may not be that well because of the cost implication as well as the scaling issue, right? And the third important part of threat hunting is knowing the network, right? The most important thing <coughs> about threat hunting is you need to understand what the attacker is doing inside a network, right? And it also gives you the advantage that the attacker should, is not that well on understanding in terms of how your network works. You are the best one who is better uh, suited at uh, knowing the entirety of the network. So you can use that as an advantage to actually hunt the enemy. So today's problems. So the today's problems with the threat hunting tools are aggregating logs. That's the, that's the most uh, important thing that we can find at this point of time. Second thing is real-time monitoring. Real-time monitoring is uh, looking at the health of the system, maybe to, trying to make sure that uh, it is properly backed up, it has uh, uh, proper memory allocation, CPU is running fine, there are no spikes, right? There are no bottle bottlenecks. Third one is intelligent fast search. As soon as you have the log aggregated and you have the parser to actually <coughs> extract the structured data, you should be able to perform the fast search um, on uh, using different kind of analytical tools. The fourth part about today's problems with the log aggregation tool is the log format itself, right? So there are a lot of tools that are commercially available. Uh, that have different kind of log format. Some, some people use syslog, some use CSV, some use APIs, some, use, some use even use PDFs too, right? Having those uh, different disparate log formats is extremely difficult uh, to, be, to be parsed and uh, inserted into a centralized repo. The other one is using of antiquated tools to actually do the threat hunting, right? So at, at the end of the day, I mean, <clears throat> once you get the log and you get the structured data, you still need to run your own analysis. So some of the people prefer using CAT or GRIP, right? All these kind of tools that are freely available to actually do some parsing on the data. And once you go into the direction and once you have the data that is worth gigabytes and terabytes, I mean, you could, you could just go, go and grab a coffee and come back next day and probably and you'll hope that something something has happened. So it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty cumbersome. And the last one is about the cost, right? I mean, there are tools like Splunk that exist on the market today which are really, really good, but at the, end, at the end of the day, the cost is extremely, extremely high. So then you have to make a determination in terms of should I start having those commercially available tools and add a, and keep on adding cost so that I scale things thing out, or should I build my own set of tools that can be used to perform intelligent fast search to, to, to scale things out so that it can, it can better suit my organization so, so that So those are the factors that should be considered while building any kind of threat hunting tool in-house. And these are the today's problems that uh, these threat hunting tools have in the market today. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's talk about aggregating logs. So <clears throat> logs are great, right? I mean, every, every product in the market these days generate tons of logs, right? So what do we do with it, right? It has to be aggregated somewhere in a centralized repo, right? So once I have all those logs aggregated in a central repo using any, any tools like Splunk or Elasticsearch, Cassandra, or whatever that tool is, right? I still need to build log parsers to actually extract the meaningful structured data, right? So structured data can be only be <coughs> generated well using log parsers. So your log parsers should be really good enough to actually mine this data and insert into any kind of uh, log aggregation tool. Now, it will be even great if you have the ability to actually extract the, the data in real time, right? So once the data comes through any of the tools that, have the, that, that generate logs, if you can apply your log parser and actually structure and extract the data in the real time, that will be absolutely great. Second thing is about real-time monitoring, right? So 
I got the logs, I have the ability to parse the data, I have the ability to get the structured data, I have all these amazing, amazing things at my hand, but how do we know if the system is running well? So you need to have real-time real -time monitoring, right? So you, you should have the visibility in terms of looking at how the system is operating, right? Memory spikes, CPU spikes, whether or not the log data are streaming in real time at a, at a predefined interval or not. So having a centralized dashboard that does all those real-time monitoring, it will absolutely help. Third thing is about intelligent parser. So I have the data, I have the parser, everything is structured properly. Now, what do I need to do? I need to do, do the sourcing of the data, right? So it will be absolutely awesome if the aggregation tool can treat data as a code, right? So if, 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 if the data is treated as a code, then you can apply a, a, a whole bunch of regexes, a whole, a whole bunch of uh, uh, structured queries to actually do intelligent fast search. Now it will be even awesome if you can define a conceptual schema and then index the data based upon your needs, right? And then execute semantically meaningful searches so that you can get fast and efficient intelligent fast search as part of the environment. Like I spoke earlier, log formats. Log formats are really, really painful, right? So I, I, I hope that every vendor in the planet has a standard syslog or whatever that format is so that the data can be aggregated and parsed. But that's not the reality in the market today, right? Some vendors support syslog, some vendors support API, some even have PDF, right? So it's difficult to get those data. So, so that is one pain point whenever you are talking about log format. The other pain point is, the way the, the data has been represented by some of the vendors, right? So the attack severity of, let's say, medium by trend macro means something else as opposed to attack severity of medium by Palo Alto. Those are not, not the same, right? So again, if there is a good standard that can be applied in this kind of things, then again, log sourcing, log aggregation, light intelligent fast source will be absolutely helpful in terms of organization need. The other problem with the, with the, with the current solution that, that we have, like I, sp I spoke earlier, was regarding use of antiquated tools like CAT, regexes, right? The pretty stupid regexes, still, right? So when we were talking about millions of uh, gigabytes or terabytes worth of data, right? At that point of time, and if you start using these kind of tools, then your fast searches or your indexes are never built well, and you will never uh, be able to uh, get to the get to the haunting that you are supposed to do. So, what are the threat haunting data sources at this point of time on any organization? So, I roughly categorize uh, the threat hunting data source into three different types. One is the network, right? So, you have firewalls, you have firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, bridge detection system, your DNS queries, and all those kind of things. Those are those. Those are a really, really good source of network-based vector where you can aggregate uh, the, the, the logs. So these tools, these data sources are typically used to determine what is the attack vector for the attack, uh, what kind of network movement uh, attacker is doing. The second source of attack, so, so source of uh, data source for threat hunting is the endpoint, right? Your, your typical EDRs, your advanced endpoint of the world, your operating system event manager, sysmon of the world, right? So it gives a pretty good visibility in terms of how the, once the attacker gets into the endpoint, what is he doing? What kind of malware artifacts are dropped in the environment? What are the platform vulnerabilities that are tied to the, the, to the operating system? Once you have that kind of data, it will be even better for you to correlate uh, those uh, different data sources together, and then you can actually go and hunt something out. The third one that is really important is Thread Intel 2. So Thread Intel, by definition, doesn't give you uh, the ability to predict the attack in the future. It gives you the, the, the information about the, the patient zero attack the, that has already happened. Maybe there, there was a command and control server that is being utilized by an attack, active attacker at some point of time, and that, that CNC infrastructure again popped up, right? So that can be used to actually you, uh, you correlate the information between the network endpoint and the modus operandi of the attacker. So once you have all these three different data sources, then you should be able to effectively go and hunt uh, the, the, the enemy. So threat hunting IOCs, right? So there are different things that logs generate. A lot of noises, right? So you should be able to filter out signal from the noise. So what are the typical threat hunting indicator of attack that any threat analyst or any threat hunting guy should be looking at? 
it could be network traffic that is typically denied by your firewall or IPSs, right? On user DNS requests, any sign of DDoS activity, if there is a spike on and the traffic at one of your applications, that could very well signify that some adversary is actually tr trying to DOS your, DOS your app. Uh, any kind of suspicious registry activity or file, uh, file system changes on the, on the endpoint itself, right? Large number of requests for the same file. Uh, red flags, if there is a brute force attack happening, then there might be a lot of failures inside the, um, uh, on the endpoint itself, right? Unusual activity with privilege account. Uh, less privileged user trying to access a, a, a file server that is only, uh, that only has a privilege to, to be granted towards uh, admin user. So at that point of time, it might very well signify that somebody is actually trying to look for something that he shouldn't be looking at, right? The domains, obvious bad domains, obvious bad URLs, right? File names, right? File hashes, um, mismatch port application traffic, right? So, so all these kind of things. So all these kind of things are, can be utilized to actually uh, do a better threat hunting. So I'll leave it to uh, my co colleague, uh, Fritz, to, 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 uh, for the second half of the presentation, where we'll be actually talking about what are the different criteria that we actually use to uh, build a scalable uh, infrastructure as well as architecture so that any uh, organization that doesn't want to use uh, commercial uh, commercial <coughs> solution or the solution that exists in the market today. So this aggregation can be actually applied towards that goal. So, Fritz. Right. Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, I'm Fritz Venter. Uh, as I introduced, uh, I do the all, all things data in the company. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to share with you is uh, this slide here that um, it uh, gives us uh, a sort of a kind of a more of a, uh, a delineation of the different phases of threat hunting missions. So I, built, I broke it into the standard old uh, uh, phases of plan, build, and run. So plan is firstly understand the logs that you want to ingest and uh, and process, and uh, what attack steps are you actually going to monitor? Are you going to just look at the initial attack step? Are you going to look at all the callbacks? Are you going to look at the first callback? Are you going to look at other CNC uh, operations afterwards, uh, whatever you want to look at. Uh, and then the bold phases are where you actually define how you're going to use, uh, how you're going to extract information out of the logs and um, how you're going to do so-called log sample correlation. And then the run phase, uh, how does all of this run efficiently? Uh, we're targeting in the order of millions of messages per second. And that is at commercial product rates. Uh, so we, we can achieve that. Uh, I'll show you some results later. So um, how do we scale? How do we make sure that this thing actually does it at scale? So these are the um, top level system requirements. If, if you were to visualize, build this system and this is the requirement. This is what you need to do, okay? So these are the top things that we uh, had in mind when we initially designed the system and develop the system. So firstly, uh, what are the different sources that we're going to ingest? Uh, secondly, what kind of formats do we expect to be able to, to parse and to process uh, into further phases? Um, what kind of scale are we targeting? Uh, we know that we're probably facing massive amounts of uh, messages and we need to, if we can, uh, process as they happen. So. Uh, not post-mortem dump everything into one big database and then parse it after that and then figure out what happened. Try and get it done as soon as the message is generated. Um, ease of use. Uh, how do you use the system? Uh, people of high level skill may define the tricky parts and then low level skill people can do the general additional configurations and maintenance. Uh, and then integration, how do we integrate from the source side and how do we integrate from the other side, the systems that will be using the outputs of this system. Uh, and uh, Jay has referred to the cost, how can we make it as uh, cost effective as possible and principle of open source has been applied for that. So th those requirements brings us into the system we call Hanshin, which is this thread hunting system. So going a bit more into event and sample sources, uh, uh, Jay has already referred to what type of uh, devices that we want to ingest uh, events from. So those would be inline, agent-based, out-of-band devices. Um, 
We also want to monitor the endpoints. Uh, so as far as possible, get as much as you can out of the endpoints as well. Uh, then on the other side is how do you test the system that it works? So you need to be able to have a strong sample feed, uh, which would be lucky in our case we have it. Uh, and you need to be able to run the samples through the system and see how well have we detect those samples. Uh, and we, we can orchestrate perfectly every step of the, of the check chain or the, the kill chain so that we can see how well every step has been detected. Uh, and then event ingestion, how do we ingest the events? Uh, how do we, um, uh, so one of the core and most used ones is these logging intermediaries like syslog. Luckily, a lot of, uh, of the uh, event sensors, the event sourcing systems actually support that. But you also need to do some custom integration. You also need to sometimes have a fast ingestion API that, that also feeds into, the, into your system. Uh, so what event formats? So those are some examples. So some, most of the events that we, that we parse are either extracted out of uh, standard uh, text-based uh, uh, network sources or extracted out of PDF. But if you look at the actual events themselves, you know, those two there that I show you, they are from two different vendors and they look totally different. They have some similarities, but it's pretty much a mess. If you want to try and extract the same semantical variables out of them um, across, let's say, you have five or ten vendors that you want to used to, to, to generate your events. Some of them are serialized, uh, struct much more structured, uh, like you can see that Sysmon type event there. So um, very diverse formats. How do you handle all of them? Okay, scale, uh, I, I said, uh, I mentioned that before. Our target uh, for scale is uh, in the order of a million uh, events per second. Uh, that's what we want to process. And so all the decisions that we made in terms of the architecture and the development of the system were driven by this target. And ease of use. Uh, so we, we recognize that some of the configurations like tricky reg access or whatever you need may have to be done by high level, high, highly skilled people, but you want to limit that and then make it in, let's call it inheritable, so that other people can reuse those predefined fields. And then your general, uh, so your general users can add to that and maintain that and whatever. Right, and then we also want to minimize configuration duplication. You don't want to have to copy and paste these configurations all over the show and make mistakes. So define once, so the good old uh, principle of don't repeat yourself, the dry principle. And then we, to, to make things as fault tolerant or as uh, robust as possible, maximize automation. So everything should run on a continuous basis. Then uh, on integration, uh, from day one, we decided we're going to go for a streaming first architecture. That means that uh, it's not a batch-based processing after, after collecting a whole bunch of events from, all the many, from many, many logs. Uh, we want to we have events stream and get processed as soon as they are entered into our system. Um, then uh, we also want to expose intermediate results so that uh, if you want to debug the configuration of the system, it, you, can, you can look at it at every step uh, so that you can tweak and, fi and fix it as, uh, as easy as possible. And then uh, on the other side of the system, on the output side, we want to also stream. So although some events will probably land up and go into a, a static state or a... a, a in, not in motion, uh, st uh, as soon as, as any sample has been processed and matched, the rest should then stream again for other systems that are consumers of the outputs and the cost we've mentioned before. So what is the, how, what, what is the system context? This is a high level di diagram that describes the, the different pieces uh, of, of important uh, building blocks outside of the system and the building blocks inside of the system. So you'll see there um, on the right, on your right, uh, the light blue piece is the system that we developed. Uh, and then 
in the context of, of samples, yeah, the, uh, the kill chains, um, uh, we have also the ability to run samples. We have the ability to orchestrate and uh, execute samples. Uh, so that information is, is one of the key inputs to, to this system. We need to be able to ingest what it was, the truth, the base, uh, sort of the, the ground truth of what happened in real life into the system. And then our event sources. Those are the systems that we install in an organization that are um, uh, going to do the detection for us and find uh, and match where, what tax steps, ha tax steps have happened. So um, inside the system, there are three major components. One is the sample processing. The other one is processing the events from external providers. And then the key part of correlating. So we, what we want to do is we want to correlate things that we know up front about samples with what other systems have told us that they found about the samples. So that's what we call so-called uh, sample to event correlation. And all of that's controlled through this configuration. I'm going to go into much more detail about that. And then there's going to be a feedback loop here. So as you run the system, you see, but we made mistakes. We're missing things. We can, we can, know, we can pick up the ground truth. Uh, we can tweak the configuration of our, our source systems, and we can tweak the configuration of the Hanshan system so um, to make sure in the end it works well and, and it's accurate. So um, what we use to configure the system is a distributed, distributed representation of these configurations. So every hunting mission, it's also called a project in our world, um, has different pieces to it. Uh, we define it in YAML. It's an easy to understand language. Um, we have input rules, uh, so in some cases we have to pull data out of uh, um, the uh, sample automation system to know what samples, which samples have been run. So you may want to look across a set of samples, how did we perform to see uh, how we detected those samples. So um, then the, the next piece is the field extraction. Uh, that's very similar to the Splunk uh, kind of syntax you have where you can you can uh, do rig access and, and extract different fields. Uh, uh, it's, we use a, uh, a variant of, of the Python syntax for that. Uh, or you can use constants where you just wanted to annotate certain records as being something that you know it is. Uh, event processing rules, um, what we do there is we often find that uh, we don't have a choice, but everything is lumped into one bucket onto our system. So whether it came from a trend uh, event source or it came from uh, some other vendor, we don't know. So we have to pull everything apart. So that's where we do filtering. And uh, we do annotation. And then we pass it on to different further nodes in a so-called execute graph, uh, execution graph. Um, and then outputs are forwarded to different intermediate places like tables or indexes or whatever we need for the result processing phase. Uh, and then the, the very important sample event correlation, uh, wh where we use, a, again, a Python-like expression syntax to express when do you think that a, a sample has been detected by uh, whoever is, is streaming data into us. Um, I'll show you an example of that later. Then, sample, then uh, all of this is managed through a central uh, configuration control environment so that you can make sure you keep track of everything. And uh, these, these configurations are updated automatically. So as you change it, all the different workers that run in the system, because it has to scale out quite wide, uh, can pick it up and know that they have to refresh themselves. So um, this is an example of how you define it. That's YAML syntax. This is a few examples of where you run queries against uh, your database. At the bottom, we also have ways to extract traffic information. So if you want to look at call callbacks, for instance, uh, to match every single callback that a sample has actually made and to see whether we have detected every single one of those callbacks, we need to extract it out of traffic files. So next piece of uh, this is you'll see is uh, often uh, regular expressions. But we also have a concept called helper functions, uh, where if it's a very unknown uh, um, 
if it's a known format. Uh, there's helper functions, so let's say vendor X has got a certain format. Uh, we, we provide it up front so the user doesn't have to think about regexes. Uh, um, you can see also the inheritance capability of, of YAML, so that little to left uh, less than signs. Uh, you can bring in generic fields so you don't have to redefine them. Um, and then the, the actual topic rules. The reason why we use the word topic is um, we use Kafka as the the core of the messaging uh, pl platform, which gives us an enormous amount of scale. Um, so for every one of the so-called topics that uh, is available in, in the system, uh, you have rules. So that expression there would be to only pick the specific vendor or specific source uh, systems events so that you can process them accordingly. And then you can define outputs for that so you can uh, send it into an in, in-memory data frame so you can visualize it on, it, on, a, on the tool, or you can send it off to an intermediate table, or we sometimes send it out to elastic search indexes for further uh, debugging. Okay, so the output rules, the most important piece here is the, is the those, those two, so you, there's a thing there called correlation definitions, and there's one called breach, and after that called callback. So in this example, we have two attack steps that we're modeling. And that expression there gives us a way to match up the known information about the sample with what we've extracted from the uh, actual events that came through from the vendors. And then the callback there is another example. Uh, you can see also it's a, there's some syntactic sugar added to the Python syntax. So if, for instance, if you want to read from a lookup file, uh, there's a CSV keyword. If you want to look at the timing of a previous event to make sure you only get events after the previous event. So those are examples of the syntactic sugar. This is the major uh, uh, things that happen. I see my time is almost up. Um, five, okay. Uh, these are the major uh, activities that happen at three different phases. Firstly, we source events, then we prepare them, and then we did prepare the results. Very logical, simple idea. Um, and you can see what kind of inputs go in and what the outputs are generated from every phase. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail of that. So this diagram over here uh, shows some of the active components that we use that are open source based. Uh, so we have a pointer here. Yeah. Um, so, the, so if you look at sample input processing, uh, the double boundary of that block means that is scaled out, so we have multiple instances of that running. Uh, and then um, the event processing, that's the one that does the extractions from the fields. That one is also scaled out. And then you'll see topics over there. That's the Kafka environment that is uh, a multi-broker, multi-partition uh, environment to make it extremely scalable, uh, almost horizontally scalable. Um, and you'll see in the middle there are three intermediate formats that we use. We use Cassandra because of its massive write uh, capacity. We, can write, we, can't, we cannot write data fast enough for Cassandra to, to fail. It is amazing how fast it can handle that. So you can see how we try to, to provide the infrastructure that will scale as much as we possibly can. And then on the output side, the result processing, that is uh, going through a stage uh, environment, and we also have specific topics related to the outputs that you can subscribe to as a consumer, as an external party that wants to consume what the system has done or the results that was uh, achieved for any sample, whatever, or set of samples. Uh, so, and the way that we scale the internal side of things. You can see the input worker, event worker, result worker, matching exactly those three different phases that I've, I've given you. Those are scaled out using infrastructure as code as infrastructure, I think. Uh, a, a tool called Nomad, very similar to Kubernetes. Uh, so we dockerize and microservice everything, and we can scale out the workers as far as possible as needed. Uh, to be able to handle the load that uh, we're going to throw at, at the system. So that, those core rules that I defined before, uh, a, a subset of those are handled by the input worker, and another subset of those are handled by the event worker, and finally the output rules by the result worker. 
and they are dedicated to those rules and they process them at a very high rate. Some uh, results that we've achieved, uh, we have achieved more than in the order of 400,000 um, events per, per second, but theoretically we know we, we can achieve more than a million uh, per second. The system is actively used today by our staff and they are an, as average skilled staff and they find it easy to use. Uh, as it, it works pretty well for, for us, for our purposes. So finally, um, I try to use, by the way, I've, I haven't mentioned that, I use the icon, icons to show you where we actually address those different uh, requirements, but I think we did achieve all of those uh, um, initial system requirements, and that takes us to questions. Thank you. All righty, thank you very much. Uh, can we have a round of applause, please? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jane Fritz. Um, I didn't see any questions pop up on the, via the app, so if there are any questions on the floor, if you're just not using an app, that's fine. Does anyone have any questions at all? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, hi guys. Thanks for that talk. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering what kind of user interface you uh, you think would be optimal for something like this. Do you rely on visualizations, or do you just use uh, uh, the output to feed into other systems? So it it, it, it really de it, it really depends. So the system can be utilized by any skilled uh, IT worker. It doesn't necessarily mean that a, a person has to be really good at threat analysis or malware research or those kind of things, right? So. And every skilled user can actually go and build the hunting mission. Uh, in terms of actually consuming the data and in terms of actually correlating the data, I mean, the best option that we found out at this time, point of time is actually visualizing things, right? So it, it kind of relates to people rather than having a, I don't know, a bit of a complex red access that is tied to a threat hunting mission. If you have some buttons or some uh, visualization uh, capability, I mean, it will be much more easier for people to understand and actually go and seek those machines. Can I also add to that? Yeah. Uh, we're also using um, an open source tool called uh, IPython Notebook. I don't know if anybody knows that. Uh, that if you, you, you would have seen one of the outputs would be a data frame. So in, in, the, in the development phase, when you're building your rules, you can visualize actually what has uh, the system detected not using um, so-called pandas data frames, and it's very easy to visualize uh, on that tool. That is the interim phase for us. I think in the future we are probably going to add a very nice um, uh, management console. Uh, you, you would have seen it in one of the slides, but that's a future phase. We're going to build a very, you know, much more, you know, uh, graphical uh, front end to it. Thank you. Uh, were there any other questions on the floor? All right, Jane Fritz, everyone. Thank you.